the ball pit, a quintessential staple of 80s and 90s kid culture. This seemingly simple idea of a pool filled with plastic balls has become a pop culture icon over the years. To this day, many look back on the concept with great nostalgia. In recent years though, ball pits have been gradually phased out. Even before the pandemic, the ball pit was nowhere near as common in the 2010s as it was in the 80s and 90s. But what happened to this concept, and why did its mainstream popularity fall off? Let's take a look at the rise and fall of the ball pit right here on Theme Park Crazy. Though the ball pit is mostly associated with the 80s and 90s, its story actually began in the 1940s with a man named Eric McMillan. Born in 1942, McMillan spent much of his childhood growing up in post-war England. McMillan faced a difficult upbringing in poverty. His family had to steal coal for heat in the winter, he wore rags as clothing, and his working class father was mostly absent from his life. The only entertainment he had access to was playing in the rubble of blown out buildings. Despite these dreadful conditions though, one thing McMillan still had was his creativity. As The Guardian put it, the other side of a childhood of neglect is absolute freedom, adding, there were no restraints, no control. At age 15, McMillan drew a painting of a tree that was accepted into a local gallery. This got him a spot at a trade school. At first, McMillan planned on entering the workforce as a house painter. However, the trade school was attached to an art school, and McMillan would spend a lot of time networking with the art school students. The more he communicated with them, the more interested he was in attending the art school. After months of rigorous studying and networking, McMillan would take and pass the exams, earning a spot in the art school. After graduating a few years later, he would design a few art exhibitions in England. By the 1960s, he had earned enough money to leave Great Britain to further pursue his design career. McMillan would move to Canada after seeing an ad looking for designers for Expo 67. At first he would move to Ottawa, but in 1968, he would move to Toronto to join the design team of the developing Ontario Place Entertainment venue. First opening in 1971, this venue would promote the province of Ontario with a variety of exhibits and entertainment. One of these exhibits named Explosions would be designed by Macmillan. This audiovisual experience would use 90 projectors to tell the story of Ontario's socio-economic development. Macmillan's work on the exhibit was so well received that Ontario Place officials promoted him to chief designer. The next year would see Macmillan's first major project as chief designer open, a new playground for kids named Children's Village. The purpose of this project was to give bored children something fun to do at the complex, but Macmillan had no interest in building an ordinary playground. According to him, playgrounds at the time were quote, architectural graveyards, gray asphalt slabs. They've been built by adults who've forgotten how to play. So for this project, he wanted the result to be much more colorful and creative. Macmillan, along with his assistant Dave Lloyd, would come up with several unique attractions for the play area. These included an enormous mattress, a punching bag forest, a vinyl mountain, and so much more. Everywhere you turned, there was something fun to do. In many ways, Macmillan was giving the visitors at Children's Village the childhood he didn't get to experience. Instead of concrete rubble, children got to experience soft structures made out of vinyl and foam. These materials allowed for more color and safety, allowing children to play with much less injuries than a typical playground. This led Macmillan to be known as the father of soft play for his playtime innovations in foam and plastic. Immediately upon its opening in 1972, the project was a massive success, and it would receive widespread critical acclaim. Time Magazine would call it, quote, one of the most imaginative playgrounds in the world. Macmillan would continue to work at Ontario Place and would eventually develop a water park for the complex. Soon enough, his work would catch the attention of SeaWorld in San Diego, California. Park officials planned on opening up their own children's area, and they wanted Macmillan on board to design it. Always wanting to think outside the box, Macmillan would come up with even more attractions for the new area. One of these concepts would come to mind after observing a jar of pickled onions. Macmillan would tell the BBC, quote, There was a jar of onions, and we were sort of saying, Wow, how about if you could crawl through those? And then, ding, we decided we'd try it. With that, Macmillan got the idea of taking a small pool and filling it up with small plastic balls in place of the onions. 
On the other hand, fellow soft play designer Jack Pentis claimed the concept also originated in Europe as physical therapy for disabled children. In this practice, plastic balls that were used for insulating swimming pools were used. According to Pentis, the sensation of all those balls in their bodies would lead them to try and improve their movement. Either way, this concept had never been utilized for entertainment, and thanks to Macmillan and a jar of pickled onions, the ball pit was born. In 1976, SeaWorld San Diego would open the new area, known as Cap'n Kids World. One of its many interactive attractions was the ball crawl. Photos and video of this are rare, but it was shown to have red, blue, yellow, and green plastic balls. Like Children's Village, the play area was a hit with children, and the ball crawl was considered to be among the best features. The appeal of the ball pit stemmed from its interactivity. As Macmillan put it, a child needs play areas he can affect directly with his senses and curiosity. To a child, play and learning are the same process. Children were able to interact with the plastic balls in various ways. Kids could throw them, dive in them, roll in them, and jump in them without knowing how to swim or risking serious injury. After SeaWorld, the ball pit became the hottest new thing in the amusement industry. Macmillan would soon bring the concept to other parks across North America. These included Ontario's Santa's Village, Tennessee's Opryland, and Illinois' Marriott's Great America. And here's an interesting fact, the one at Great America was said to have 100,000 plastic balls. Moreover, he would also design a ball pit for Pennsylvania's Sesame Place, a theme park based on Sesame Street. This new ball pit, named the Count's Ballroom, would open with the park in 1980. This pit would hold an impressive 80,000 plastic balls uh, uh, uh. and win over countless children. This ball pit was so successful, the park would eventually open up a second one and even a third one meant just for babies. In addition to the ball pit, the late 70s and early 80s saw the rise of indoor children's play spaces. Parents at the time were growing more risk averse and many didn't want their children playing out in the open. To them, playgrounds in controlled indoor environments presented a much less likely risk of abduction. Plus, they didn't have to worry about what the weather was going to be like. So in addition to several more theme and amusement parks, the ball pit concept would expand to children's pizza places. The 1980s would see the likes of Showbiz Pizza and Chuck E. Cheese's install brand new ball pits. While their arcade games would cater to the big kids, these ball pits would entertain the smaller children. Chuck E. Cheese's would regularly advertise their ball pits, and soon enough, the concept became a staple of the pizza place. But Mr. Cheese wasn't the only one in on the craze, because in 1987, a clown named Ronald McDonald entered the fray. That year, the McDonald's restaurant chain would debut Ronald's Play Place. This play place would allow children to play around while their parents ate in peace. Without a doubt, the play place took cues from Macmillan's work, focusing predominantly on curiosity and soft play. There were slides, tubes to crawl through, climbing sections, and of course, ball pits. The concept was an instant hit, and play places would pop up at McDonald's all across the country. It was such a big hit that McDonald's would actually open up their own chain of indoor amusement centers in 1991 called Leaps and Bounds. These locations would focus less on burgers and fries and more on birthday parties and souped up play places. However, the chain would only last three years. This was due to high competition not only from Chuck E. Cheese's, but from the one and only Discovery Zone. First opening in 1989, Discovery Zone expanded upon Macmillan's soft play concepts. Its most memorable features included a rubber climbing grid, a plastic roller slide, a zip line, and the iconic climbing pyramid inside of a ball pit. This added even more excitement to an already popular concept, and it would become the chain's star attraction. Through the 1990s, the ball pit would continue to spread like wildfire, showing up at various stores and restaurants across the country. Burger King had the BK Kids Club, Ikea had Smoland, and even Miami Subs had its very own ball pit. In addition, ball pits would continue to thrive at amusement and theme parks. At one point, Disneyland had a Chip and Dale themed ball pit in their Toontown section. This pit named the Acorn Crawl was notable for having plastic balls shaped like acorns. The possibilities for this concept truly seemed endless. By the late 90s, the ball pit had built a legacy of its own and was an international phenomenon. Soft play places had also become popular in other countries like the United Kingdom and Brazil. All over the world, one man's concept based on a jar of onions had become a global sensation. 
But not everything was smooth sailing, as there was trouble on the horizon. During the 90s, the public had begun to express more safety concerns about the ball pits. One issue was the fact that Play Place ball pits often had slides leading into them. If someone was buried beneath the surface under the slide, another person could easily land on top of them without knowing they were there. This led to one incident in 1995 that resulted in the death of a teenager. As a result of this incident, several play places placed pads underneath the ball pit entrances to stop kids from jumping on each other. Another concern was with older children accidentally injuring smaller kids by falling on top of them. For this reason, many play places had height limits of around 4 feet and would include signs for children to use as guides. Beyond physical injuries, there was also the growing fear of unwanted objects falling into the ball pit. Realistically, there was no way to tell what was beneath the surface, and many ball pits were only cleaned once a week. It was common to find things like scrunchies, pacifiers, and stale french fries in the ball pits, but even worse things could be concealed. Over the years, a variety of horror stories started to emerge of dangerous objects found in the ball pits. Several employee testimonies mentioned dirty diapers being found, one user on Reddit claimed to find a rusty pair of scissors, and one of my viewers claimed to cut his foot on a piece of broken glass. As early as the 90s, there were rumored to be hypodermic needles in snakes as well, though these were said to be mere urban legends. Even still, many former Play Place employees claimed the ball pits were much filthier than anyone wanted to imagine. Since young children are prone to accidents, it wasn't uncommon for a kid to wet their pants and the parents be too embarrassed to inform the employees, so the pit would go unwashed as a result. And I won't even mention the problems number two presented, the very thought of it says enough. If a kid had an accident or got sick in a ball pit, the whole area would have to be shut down and thoroughly cleaned. Over time, several cleaning methods were used to sanitize ball pits. One method used a high-pressure water gun to clean the plastic balls and blow them back into the play area. Other methods involved machines that sucked up the plastic balls and put them through a miniature wash cycle, and these machines would evolve over the years. However, these methods were still methodical and often took hours. Because of this, many play places were guilty of cutting corners when it came to cleanliness and didn't properly maintain their ball pits. This added even more fuel to the negative public reception, and many parents found it difficult to trust the establishments that had ball pits. Their kids were literally rolling around in a pool of plastic balls that many other children before had played in. What if the pit wasn't cleaned properly? What was lurking on the bottom? What if a kid had an accident earlier? All of these questions were important. The perceived nastiness of the ball pit gave the concept an unwanted reputation of being unhygienic. So much so that there's even a TV Tropes page dedicated to the perception called Foul Ball Pit. Just look at what happened to Greg Heffley and Vin Diesel. By the early 2000s, the popularity of the ball pit had started to wane. Many establishments grew concerned about potential injury lawsuits and cleanliness concerns. So many of them had decided to stop adding ball pits to new play places. In a 2000 interview with the Tampa Bay Times, Chick-fil-A's chief corporate architect declared that the chain would never install a ball pit. Specifically, he brought up the difficult upkeep and hygiene concerns, saying, quote, It's extremely difficult to monitor whether there are surprises down there. While children still loved ball pits, their parents' concerns over hygiene and safety meant more to the business world. For these reasons, Disneyland would remove its Chippendale ball pit around 1998 leaving an empty, concrete pit abandoned for years. Although ball pits were still widespread in the 2000s, the decade would see the concept slowly start to fizzle out. Around this time, fast food restaurants began to phase out their ball pits, and by 2001, every Discovery Zone location had closed down for good. Though this was more due to the company's overexpansion and debt, it was still nonetheless a symbol of the decline of the ball pit. Of course, the concept wasn't killed off completely, and some restaurants and indoor play centers still had ball pits for a while. But as the 2010s came around, the trend was clear. Ball pits were too much of a hassle to maintain and keep clean. On the other hand, the dying out of children's ball pits didn't mean the complete death of the concept. Ball pits may have had a bad hygienic reputation, but they still had great nostalgic value to those who grew up in the 80s and 90s. And in the 2010s, the ball pit had a newfound popularity with adults. During the decade, several pop-up bars and exhibits would feature adult-sized ball pits. At these places, grown men and women could lounge around and experience the same sensations they did as children. 
These would be a hit with the general public and quite popular on Instagram. In addition, the 2010s saw two major ball pit milestones. In 2013, the Cary Hotel in Shanghai, China broke the record for the world's largest ball pit. Set up to raise awareness for breast cancer, this pit had a grand total of 1 million plastic balls. And just two years later in 2015, Shenyang China's World Ice Arena broke that record with 2.08 million plastic yellow balls. Furthermore, the concept was still popular with children internationally, with Brazil often said to be among the top markets for ball pit manufacturers. At the 2018 IAPA Expo, one Turkish manufacturer named Buzz Park Turkey revealed entire furniture sets made of ball pit balls. They would also feature a crush-proof plastic ball design, which was designed to stay round even under an adult's weight. A definite step up from the old designs that would cave in on themselves. So while the ball pit was nowhere near as widespread as it once was, it was still seeing somewhat of a resurgence. Unfortunately, this resurgence would hit a snag with the release of a 2019 study by the American Journal of Infection Control. The study looked at a physical therapy ball pit and found it to be jam-packed with germs. Media sources that cover this report pointed out that four bacteria in particular were linked to diseases like skin infections, pneumonia, and meningitis. The media went nuts with this story, no doubt leading parents to assume the worst out of ball pits. On the other hand, actual doctors struck a much less alarmist note when discussing the study. They said while the bacteria could pose risks for children with weak immune systems, it's extremely unlikely that they would actually cause severe diseases in children. What they did find is that a lot of bacteria can live in uh, these ball pits. The, the majority of the bacteria itself were bacteria that you would kind of expect. Bacteria that is normally found on your skin, normally found in your mouth, and some of uh, the bacteria that's found in your gut. Washing your hands uh, before and after jumping in uh, to a ball pit, understanding that they will get exposed to germs in a ball pit just like they will be exposed to germs at any playground facility, that, that it's okay. That most of, and nearly everybody who jumps into a ball pit are gonna be fine when they come out of the ball pit, they'll be fine. Some doctors even suggested that the bacteria would actually help children build their immune systems. Nonetheless though, the damage had been done, and the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 seemed to be the final nail in the coffin for the ball pit. As more people wanted to avoid getting sick, many were unwilling to share a ball pit with other members of the public. That summer, McDonald's CEO Chris Kempsinski told Time Magazine, quote, I don't know if we've got ball pits in our future. Although some children's ball pits do still exist, they have become a true rarity nowadays. With sanitation a top priority for businesses, it's extremely unlikely we'll see this concept as widespread as it was. Fortunately, the demand for ball pits is still alive and well. At the start of the pandemic, orders for ball pit supplies were in high demand from lockdown families. And while ball pits are continuing to close in public places, there's still an undeniable appeal to the concept. Just recently, pop-up museum Color Factory announced a St. Patrick's Day-themed ball pit for Chicago this June. The fact that the pandemic didn't completely kill off the concept just goes to show how much of an impact it made. Though its mainstream popularity has fallen since the 90s, it still lives on in many ways. It's truly a fascinating story. Eric McMillan went from wearing rags to school to making childhood memories around the world. It is indeed truly inspiring, and just think, it all started with a jar of onions. And now, once again, it's time for the comment shoutout program. This is where I take three random comments from my previous video and read them out loud. If you want to see your comment in my video, feel free to comment down below and it may be selected. Just know though that no inflammatory comments will be chosen. Anyway, YouTube user JoelWeed1028 says, quote, Harley Quinn Crazy Coaster was only open for a couple of hours during my one visit to Six Flags Discovery Kingdom in 2018. I skipped it. YouTube user Terry Lynn Starr says, quote, This video caught my eye since I've actually ridden it once before. Weird how I didn't know it closed even though the last time I visited Six Flags was a couple months ago. And YouTube user Jared TM says, quote, I remember this coaster being first announced. And now seeing it closing only after two years of operation is just shocking to me. Thank you all so much. And if you want to support me on Patreon, you can do so once again at the link in the description.
Thanks for watching everyone. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at themeparkcrazy.com. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you.